Hey guys, it's Neon. This is Clownfish TV. Welcome back. We're going to talk about comic books today. Comic books, manga, digital comics, uh, the state of the comic book industry. We've, we've talked more about that on this channel in the past. We haven't really talked a whole lot about it uh, in the last couple of months because there really hasn't been a lot of news. A lot of it's been kind of doom and gloom, I guess, uh, the state of the comic book industry, you know, with a few exceptions. Uh, with a few exceptions, it does seem like things are transitioning right now, that the comic book industry actually is kind of being disrupted, um, not on its own, but by circumstances, uh, you know, that could be argued whether or not these circumstances are outside of their control, whether it's people that are you know, moving on to other media or the comic book industry is just, you know, burning itself to the ground. I think it's, it's actually a combination of, uh, of the two things, but we're going to talk about this article I've seen uh, floating around on Twitter. Uh, I think some other YouTubers have covered it. Um, I don't know exactly what the takeaway has been from this article, but I have some opinions on it. Uh, basically, my opinion is that the comic book industry has been in dire need of disruption for quite some time, but every time somebody tries to disrupt it, uh, the comic book industry either pushes back or tries to uh, co-opt uh, the movement for itself. You know, putting its own people in, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. We've seen this time and time again. Geeky and I, especially having worked in uh, indie comics and web comics, we've seen the mainstream industry try to basically put the same group of people in anytime they see there's another avenue uh to sell comics there's a better way to sell comics they try to install people from marvel and dc or from the mainstream in into that um and i'm going to bring up some examples of you know some attempts at disruption that are now i believe controlled by the big two for all intents and purposes or at least you know club comics the uh, comic book community and uh it's very very hard for anybody anybody from the outside to get into comics and actually, you know, make a living in the comic book industry without having those connections in to the mainstream. Even if you're an independent creator, it seems like it's very, very hard uh, to, to make a living in comics if you don't have those mainstream connections, if you don't have connections to the comic book bloggers, if you don't have connections to the right people at conventions. Uh, you know, once, once the blood supply is cut off to you and you're truly on your own, uh, you know, it's kind of a scary place. There are people who have done it, but uh, even people that are, that are you know, quote unquote independent still tend to, whether it's their choice or the industry's choice, have some sort of a tie to the mainstream industry. And we're going to talk a little bit uh, about this and just kind of our experiences and uh, observations over the last couple of years. Um, so before we get into the video any further, please give us a sub if you haven't done so already. We talk about the pop culture news and views. Uh, we do have an art and animation channel we're trying to get off the ground. If you want more art content, more talk about uh, illustration, and comics, that sort of thing, it's Clownfish Animation. Uh, you can check that out. Uh, yeah, so let's let's talk about this. It's coming from Bleeding Cool. Now, this is not written by Rich Johnston. This is written by uh, contributor Reese uh, Gaida. 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 Sorry about that. But they're talking about how the comic book industry, this is so weird, they're talking about how the comic book industry is basically flatlined, which a lot of YouTubers have been saying for years, a lot of webcomics people have been saying for years. And YouTubers and webcomics people have uh, gotten a lot of pushback because every time we try to point out the obvious, um, you know, the industry is like, uh-uh, uh-uh. And uh, yeah, it, it, it's it's pretty obvious that the comic book industry is flatlined. Um, again, this article from Bleeding Cool, since the comics crashed in 96, the industry has sagged. The market is there, but sales are low. Yeah, we're going to talk a little bit about this too. Like they're bragging about how uh, comic sales are up this month, or rather they're up in October, but you can probably trace that back to higher cover prices. So uh, the markets there, sales are low. Estimated North American market size for print comics has grown 50% between 97 and 2018 from 500 million to 995 million. Despite all the potential buyers, unit sales of the top 300 comics for each month fell by 22% between 97 and 2018. I wonder where these comics are being sold now because uh, from where I'm sitting, it looks like comic shops are closing at, a, at an alarming rate. And um, I'm actually finding more comic books at places like Ollie's, you know, I want to know where they're being sold. Uh, I don't know, at least the single issues. I mean, the graphic novels, I can see the bookstores, I can see Amazon. 
but I'm having a really hard time figuring out where all these monthly comics are being sold because, you know, in our example, we used to have two comic book shops in this town. We don't have any. Uh, I think the closest comic book shop for us is 45 minutes to an hour from here. The biggest comic shop that we've been to lately was uh, in Pittsburgh, and it's it's quite a drive for us to get there. But yeah, the, I mean, my hometown, uh, which is on the other side of the state, my hometown, we had in a town of 80,000, we had four comic book shops in the 90s. There were four comic shops and they all did well, you know, and uh, they're they're gone. All of them, I think, are gone at this point. So where are the comic books being sold? That's what I want to know. So venture capital bros are unlikely to swoop in and disrupt the market with tech that was born yesterday. And that's for the best. Uh, yeah, maybe. Uh, that means comic publishers, distributors, and shops must reinvigorate their business. But are online shopping and delivery the answer? Uh, well, I don't know. It seems like a lot of people are doing crowdfunding now. A lot of people are reading web comics. A lot of people are, uh, you know, reading uh, manga. I think through apps like Shonen Jump. So, you know, I don't know. Possibly, comic shops keep selling expertise. So here they talk about all the comic shops closing their doors in 2017. 50 American comic shops closed. Bleeding Cool, which you know, look, spent a good amount of time uh, attacking people who were calling out the problems in the comic book industry in 2017, 2018. Uh, now they're they're finally saying, yeah, you know, they, they closed. And that's true. But I mean, Bleeding Cool was keeping a tally of these shops that closed, but uh, they were being very contrary. And I think it really had more to do with, you know, where the information was coming from, not the information itself. I'm really, again, and we'll talk about this. The comic book industry tries to install its own people wherever it can to keep control. It's just a very weird, clickish industry, you know, uh, it is what it is. I don't know how it's gotten to this point. I think because the industry sh has shrunk so much that it's become very, um, nepotistic, very incestuous, but basically the comic book industry won't listen to people unless they're vetted. They're vetted. You have to be the right kind of person. You can have a 100%, uh, correct assessment of a situation, but if you're not part of the club, if you haven't been vetted, if industry professionals have not vouched for you, your data is worthless. Uh, it's worthless. It's very, a very strange industry. Let's just let's just leave it at that. So as retail aggressively moves away from storefronts to the internet, comic book shops need to sell the in-store experience that online retailers like Comixology and Marvel uh, Unlimited cannot provide getting customers in every shops Wednesday as a ritual an opportunity to sell other things they weren't expecting to buy or to continue building that relationship. Weekly releases also allow readers to talk about the books and build a suspense for what happens next. Yeah. Here's another thing that has happened uh, lately in some of the comic shops uh, I have frequented. They've stopped selling new issues. They, this is apparently, this is not unusual. I thought it was kind of weird when about a year ago, one of my favorite comic book shops sent an email blast out and said, Hey guys, uh, because the way the market is, if we want to survive, we're going to stop selling new comic book issues. And that was followed by uh, stories of other comic shops, you know, just refusing to carry new comic book issues. Uh, there are some shops that are doing very well, you know, now, but they're selling back issues. They're selling pop culture uh, memorabilia. They're not stocking new comics. So again, Again, I want to know where these comics are being sold. I mean, they're talking about record numbers. I want to know where they're being sold because I can think of three shops off the top of my head that no longer carry, just three, that, that you know, no longer carry new comic books. And I, apparently that this is becoming more and more normal. Um, so they're talking about Diamond. This is, again, this has been a problem everybody has talked about. Now, I want to bring up the fact that uh, indie comics publishers, uh, indie comics people, web comics people have been talking about circumventing Diamond for years. Years. And when they talk about that, they get people like, you know, Eric Larson, um, you know, talking smack about web comics and talking smack about digital comics and talking smack about uh, people who self publish, you know. And th so this is. This is where I'm going with this, guys. This is where I'm going with this. They complain about the problems that people have been complaining about for years and decades, 
and there have been solutions that have been offered and at first they're usually mocked um, we have seen this time and time again you're kind of seeing it now with the the uh, indiegogo situation right you're seeing it on a whole nother level because i think you've got panic uh, thrown into the mix whereas before it was like well things are fine just you go do your silly indie comics your web comics whatever and ha 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 uh, but now it's definitely um it's definitely escalated so here's you know i want to i want to turn on the wayback machine here and uh, point out point out that uh the comic book industry if you're going to view it as like a, i guess a collective organism club comics whatever has been openly hostile to anyone who has tried to disrupt it. Openly hostile to it. Again, um, just a couple of years ago, Eric Larson uh, said that webcomicers were amateurs, producing crappy, crappy, uh, you know, here, here's what he said. He said, every crappy submission can quote unquote see print on the web. Every reprint book that would sell three copies in print would work on the web. The web is the great equalizer. Every crappy thing can get tossed up there. If it all went digital, nothing separates a pro from an amateur. Th this is, the the root of it right here and i'll talk more about that print is far more discriminating there are fixed costs which can't be ignored for long it's not like the wild west that the internet uh it's not like the wild west like the internet is that's why the web doesn't excite me a whole lot every nitwit can put stick men telling fart jokes up there's nothing special about it uh now i just want to put out there that some people doing stick comics are making millions of dollars uh now some people doing stick figure cartoons on youtube are making millions of dollars so, you know, so weird to see Eric Larson, who I, I used to have a lot of respect for, honestly, as, as kind of a pioneer in indie comics, say things like this. And, uh, you know, it's funny because he was speaking for Image Comics. You know, he was he was working with Image Comics and Image Comics, you know, got a lot of flack when it started too. Uh, Image Comics, when they broke away from Marvel when these guys broke away from Marvel, you know, they got all kinds of crap from the mainstream industry. You know, you guys are going to fail. It's going to fail. Uh, you know, you're, uh, how dare you? And at the end of the day, that's what this is. It's how dare you try to do something outside of the industry. But, you know, of course, Image Comics is still around today. However, it sort of, um, you know, has become a trendsetter in the modern mainstream comics. But I thought it was very funny that Spawn 300 was the top book in September. It actually beat out uh, Spider-Man number one by J.J. Abrams. You know, very, very funny, I thought. But Image Comics is now kind of part of the problem too, right? Because the mainstream sort of infiltrated Image, and Image is basically modern vertigo. And this happens time and time again. Every time somebody disrupts, if they are somehow successful... It seems like the mainstream sort of finds a way to get its meat hooks into that success and co-op that success or try to. And if they can't, then they try to burn it down, you know. Uh, so, again, going back to, you know, Larson kind of throwing shade at digital uh, creators. Now, this is funny, too, because, you know, now there's a lot of talk. There's a lot of talk about crowdfunding, uh, you know, ICV2 talking about crowdfunding uh, talking about how comics hit a new sales high in 2018 because of the inclusion of an estimate for us and canada sales through crowdfunding for the very first time so that's how they they hit these highs let's rewind it a little bit back to 2012 and i remember there being all kinds of shade thrown at people who would crowdfund books this is coming from the comics journal which is uh, uh owned by belief fanographics you know what? Kickstarter. Guess what? You don't get to call yourself underground if you're on Kickstarter. Guess what else? You don't get to call yourself a publisher either. You're just someone who pays a printing bill. Take pre-orders on your site. Sell your books. Don't go begging for money. Don't go begging for money on uh, Kickstarter because that's you're not a real publisher if you go to Kickstarter. <sighs> a couple months later, fans spent $150,000 to help save Fanographics. Comics journals owned by Fanographics. So Fanographics had to turn to Kickstarter to stay in business. I just, I'm just putting that out there. I'm just putting that out there. Now, because Kickstarter is considered a publisher, again, Kickstarter was, it, it was originally for people who wanted to publish their books outside the system. But now that Kickstarter is recognized as being an integral part of the comic book industry, now Club Comics has to come in and make sure that they're in charge. 
So they bring in somebody from DC Comics uh, to basically vet and oversee all these projects. You see what I'm saying? Like this, this has happened time and time and time again in comics. This is not a new thing. People think it's new. Like, oh, they're just, you know, uh, the comic book industry is out there. Um, the comic book industry is out there attacking YouTubers. Uh, yeah, before that, they were attacking uh, people who crowdfunded. Before that, they were attacking people who did web comics. The comic book industry just, it, it wants to put, they don't want disruption. You know, or if they see that a disruption is going to take place, they make sure they install people in to whatever's next. It's so weird. It's like our, our local government here. It's like the same five people getting elected to different positions. But whoever gets elected, they're all part of the same group. So you know things are never going to change because they're all part of the same group. And that's what's going on here. And anyone who tries to do things differently and does not belong to the comic book industry, does not belong to club comics, they get mocked. They get run out in a rail. Or or the other thing, which is even a little more devious, is they have a patron within the comic book industry, bring them into mainstream comics, and then sort of parade them around. Like, look, I've got... XYZ type person that I brought into the comic book industry. Give me a cookie for that. Uh, you know, it's it's just, it's crazy how this works. And we've seen it. We've been watching it for years. You know, I've worked in comics uh, for about 15 years, 15 plus years. We worked in, uh, did web comics for years. We did, uh, you know, self-publish our own stuff. And I've seen this time and time and time again. The comic book industry does not want disruption. It does not want disruption and it fights fiercely if there is anything, you know, that could potentially disrupt the same group of people being in charge. Um, this has happened before. This has happened before. You know, web comics, again, a lot of shade was thrown at web comics people for years. You know, the comic book industry was like, oh my God, web comics are amateur hour. Web comics suck. Web comics are terrible. Then people started to see the kind of money that these webcomics creators were making in ad revenue, the kind of money they were making on uh, crowdfunding. And then all of a sudden, here comes Webtoon. Webtoon, which is, uh, you know, financed by Naver out of uh, South Korea. Uh, they had like infinite money. Webtoon came in. It uh, And look, I'm not throwing shade at Webtoon. They got to do what they got to do, right? But I just want to show you how this works. So Webtoon basically came in and killed off the need for independent comic book or uh, webcomic sites. Webtoon basically killed the webcomic business model as, as indie creators knew it because everybody just started going to Webtoon. Uh, other creators just stopped hosting their own comics and they started putting them on services like uh, you know Webtoon and Topastic, etc., etc. So Webtoon sort of built its platform on the backs of all these indie creators who thought they were working outside the system, who thought that they were, you know, kind of doing things outside the box and it wasn't the mainstream. What happens? What happens? As soon as Webtoons gets uh, to size, they start hiring Marvel and DC people to come in and post comics on Webtoons. And this happened at the same time that they actually signed a deal with uh, a Hollywood agency so they could start pitching show ideas. So it's like the more things change, the more they stay the same. Mark Wade had a webcomics portal. When he saw that webcomics were uh, were doing well, he started a webcomics portal to bring in Marvel and DC people into webcomics. You know, because, but a few years before, not Mark Wade in particular, but other, other comics uh, people, his peers were mocking webcomics. You know, it's in, it's just, this has happened so many times. It's happened so many times. So now Webtoon, now I, I don't think any of these people are actually doing their comics on Webtoon now, or if they are, you're not hearing much about it now. It's almost like Webtoons used American or North American aspiring creators to build the platform to get the eyeballs. Then they started bringing Marvel and DC people in to get those eyeballs. And then when they sort of uh, outlived their usefulness, they started bringing more Korean strips in, and now they've got the deal with Crunchyroll. They're going to do anime, and guess what? It's probably not going to be based on any of this stuff. It's probably going to be based on um, their own IP from, from South Korea, if I had to guess. But you see what I'm saying here? Like, every time somebody tries to disrupt the comic book industry, if they can't smack it down, they take it over. And this has happened so many times. Alterna Comics. Um... 
because Alterna, you know, our, our friend Peter, who's been on the show a couple of times, you know, he's, he, they, they try every angle. They can't attack him because he's, he's got his, uh, his company policy is don't block people randomly for no reason. Um, you know, all the news outlets were taking Peter to task. And I don't think it's because, you know, look, if Peter was part of the comic book click, if he was playing ball, if he was, if he was, uh, in like Flynn with all of these comic book, uh, publishers, you know, and, and doing the, you know, running in those circles, then they would have probably applauded him for doing that. But because he's, he's not, he's not part of club comics. He's trying to disrupt from the outside. He gets demonized by the blogs. He gets demonized by Twitter. So when that didn't work, when they tried attacking him because of the stupid social media policy, which is a very sensible policy and most companies that aren't comic book publishers have very similar policies. Then they tried attacking him because he was printing comics on newsprint and comics were printed on newsprint for years. And because he was trying to keep the, the prices down to show that you can actually sell comics for under two bucks in, in current year uh, and get comics into places you normally couldn't get comics. Then they tried to attack him and call shenanigans on that. You know, um, it is absolutely the comic book industry is absolutely crabs in the bucket. And, uh, but it's more insidious than that. It's they watch and they let other people experiment. They sit back and they watch and they let other people take all the risk. And when they see that there is an opportunity to insert their people into, you know, a, a new, uh, sales channel, they absolutely do it again. Kickstarter was mocked. It was mocked. And then a few months later, Fanagraphics needs it to survive. And then here we are current year where we've got a DC person being installed at Kickstarter to control the, the flow of spice, to control who gets to publish comics through Kickstarter because Kickstarter is being recognized uh, now as part of the sales channel. You know, it, it, it's, it's actually kind of insidious. It really is. And it's, it's not, it's not good for independent creators because you know, like I said at the beginning of the video, it doesn't matter who you are. You know, if you want to succeed in any capacity in comics, you know, for the most part, you have to have some kind of connection, even if it's very tenuous, to the comic book cabal. If you want to sell through Diamond, you got to be the right kind of people. If you want to sell the shops, you got to be the right kind of people. If you want to be invited to conventions, if you want to be allowed to even go to conventions, somebody's got to vouch for you. You know, this... this this happens, you know, if you, if you want to get work, you know, work in independent comics and, um, you know, get a gig with Marvel and DC at some point in time, then you have to have, uh, you know, just like a club, you have to have somebody vouch for you. And if those channels are cut off, good luck, you know, and there are people now who are trying to do comics outside of all of these channels. Um, and it's going to be a very, a very hard, uh, road. It absolutely is, you know, um, but we've seen this happen so many times with comics. The comic book industry does not want to be disrupted. It just wants to move. It just wants to move its uh, base of operations. I guess it's going to let independent creators take chances, and then they're going to move move the base of operations. And I'm not saying that's wrong. I'm just saying you know at least be honest uh, with what's going on here. You know. Um, and then they've got some advice for how to how to do this. Uh, the binge model, they're talking about the TKO Studios. I'm not even familiar with them. Um, December 2018, I have no idea who they are. But they're basically uh, doing direct-to-consumer. Um, you know, will comics be more like Amazon, Netflix? I think people sell comics. Well, I think that's the thing. Amazon, Amazon is a disruptor because you can... Look, I, there are bootleg Minecraft graphic novels being sold to kids on Amazon that outsell scholastic books on Amazon. So, you know, these people have, have already figured out how to do an end run. YouTube is another way. They're YouTubers who comic book people have never heard of that are actually selling more comics than they can imagine. You know, we talked before about Chad Tronic. He's got uh, over a half of a uh, half a million subscribers on YouTube and he does mostly uh, pop culture videos. He riffs on uh, 90s pop culture and he put a comic book out and he basically broke Amazon because so many people bought this comic book, but nobody in the comic book industry knows who he is, you know? So, but as soon as they figure out what works, as soon as they figure out what works, what disruption works, they are going to, if they can't, 
uh, beat it, they're going to absolutely join it. And we've unfortunately seen, we've unfortunately seen that in some cases they try to boot the people out who actually started uh, the disruption in the first place, taking over web comics, taking over crowdfunding. Um, you know, but I would like to think that there's a lot of room for people to do whatever kind of comics they want to do and sell them independently. I do think that, you know, having an online presence is absolutely vital these days. I think you can sell direct to consumer, but if you're going to go through the traditional channel, yeah, you're going to comic book industry doesn't want to be disrupted. It, it just does not. And, um, I think trying to disrupt it is just, you're pushing a boulder up a hill. Uh, you are better off doing your own thing until people actually notice you. You know, I'm not, I'm not a big fan of uh, Scott Kurtz's opinions, right? But he said back in 2012, again, this was kind of the invasion of uh, the mainstream, the mainstream, the Marvel DC people into web comics. He said about Mark Wade's Thrillbent. He said, uh, now more than ever, the most important thing is to focus on the quality of your work. Worry not about t-shirts and advertising networks and website design posters or conventions. Um, only the best will be noticed. Words and pictures, my friends. You better figure out how to combine those things in very interesting ways. You better have compelling ideas to share because the people who are really, really good at such things are starting to notice this over here. They're coming. And you don't think that Marvel and DC are taking note of what's going on on YouTube now? You don't think that they're what they're not they're watching. You don't think that uh, if they figured out that this is this is the honey hole, this is where the money is, that they're gonna start coming over. They absolutely are. They absolutely are. So again, you know, if you're gonna make independent comics, um, I would say start today. Start today. Build your audience up. And uh, I wouldn't worry too much about the mainstream industry. It's you know I think I think independent creators are always gonna be a step or two ahead they're always going to be a step or two ahead of the mainstream, but they're always going to be nipping at your heels too, you know? Uh, but the industry doesn't want disruption at all. Just one quick thing before I wrap this up. It's so funny again, uh, Bleeding Cool now talking about disruption, now talking about the problems with the comic book industry, now talking about disruption when uh, Jude Terror, who does write uh, often for Bleeding Cool, now this was not written by Jude Terror, but he actually got himself in a little bit of trouble three or four years ago when he called out a lot of things that YouTubers are calling out uh, right now. The comic book blogs attacked him. They attacked him mercilessly. And uh, I think it's funny that Bleeding Cool and oftentimes Jude Terror attacks people on YouTube for saying basically the same thing. So again, uh, you know, when you're on the other side of it, you know, the same rules don't apply, right? If you're already in the comic book industry and you're already in that system, the rules, I guess, uh, don't don't apply. <laughs> the same rules don't apply. So I'm going to wrap this up. Please subscribe for more pop culture news, views, and rants here on Clownfish TV. This has been Neon. We will talk later. Hey, guys. Thanks for watching Clownfish TV. Please consider supporting the channel. Go to clownfishsupport.com. That's clownfishsupport.com. And if you want to join our community, go to clownfishtalk.com. That's clownfishtalk.com. Please subscribe, ring the bell for notifications. We will talk to you next time.